Hello, we are so excited to be here with you today. My name is Latrell Adams, and I have the awesome privilege of serving as one of the four uh, social emotional learning specialists for our district. And I'll pause and let my wonderful colleague introduce herself. Hello, I am Cynthia Brown. I am also one of four social emotional learning specialists in Guilford County Schools. And we're really happy to be with you today to talk about social emotional learning as parents. And this is work that we talk about quite a bit in our school district, but Latrell and I are both parents. And so we're happy um, to engage with you about how parents can be emotional coaches for their children. Yeah, absolutely. So we're gonna go ahead and just jump right in. Um, so we hope that you know, you're know you ready to get started. So today we're gonna talk about what is SEL, why we're doing his SEL and how we can get started at home. As Cynthia said, we both are parents. So this is something that we talk about on a, on a daily basis. Um, with our kids, with our families, and how we can basically just be better and do better, um, not just as professionals, but as parents in our everyday life. And so um, hopefully you'll walk away today with some of those strategies and um, be able to see the fruits of social emotional learning develop in your own life. So if we were face to face, we would all ki always kick it off with an SEL opener. SEL openers are brief interactive opportunities for us to connect and um, get connected to the work that we're about to do ahead. Um, and so what I want you to do is I want you to think about what's your parent's superpower. I want you to share um, or think about what your parent's superpower is and write that down. Um, give yourself a pat on the back. And so while we pause for you to think about what your parent's superpower is, I'll ask Cynthia to share her parent's superpower. Um, so I, my go-to is um, reflection, which is also one of my core values. Um, but I think I'm a reflective parent. I'm often stopping to think about um, how our family is functioning, what we can do better, how we can improve. We have I have those conversations with my husband and with my kids. Um, and I, and of course I, I have my own personal conversations. So I'm gonna go with reflection. Yeah, that's so good. I love reflection. Um, and I think that that is very, that is definitely like one of your uh, superpowers. So thank you for sharing that. Um, yes. If I had to pick what my parents' superpower um, is, I would say that I'm pretty flexible. Um, and, you know, I, um, while I can be very strong-willed, um, I can usually go to the other side easily if you have good points. Um, and so I even do that with my kids. Like they can get me to go to the other side um, if they're, you know, if they have good reasoning as to why I should go to that side. Um, and so I think that I'm a pretty flexible parent. So hopefully you were able to think about what your super parent powers are. Um, we all have them. Sometimes we have to dig deep and give ourselves grace and recognize, hey, I am doing this. I am doing a great job. You know, pat your, pat your own self on the back That's again. Right. Give your own self a hand clap. Um, because even the fact that you're taking a moment to watch this video on um, SEL and how you can be a better parent um, is in and of itself amazing and awesome because that means that you want to learn more and do more um, as a parent. So again, you have parent superpowers, even if you don't know that they're there, they are there. So thank you again for joining us and engaging with us on this SEO opener. So as we um, move forward, it's really important for us to talk about what our SEO vision is for our district um, and the mission of our district and um, and just why, how it all connects. And so um, our district vision is to transform the learning and life outcomes for all students. So that's our goal, is to be able to impact the life of your kid on every single day, right? That's our goal. Um, and so our SEL vision statement is through social emotional learning, Gilbert County Schools nurture safe, supportive, and equitable learning spaces where adults feel confident, empowered, and responsible for helping students develop into productive and responsible citizens who thrive in college, career, and life. Um, what I love about this SEL vision is that this SEL vision has you in mind, it has me in mind. It says that um, our SEL vision says that our goal is to create spaces where adults, so adults is not just the teachers that are in the schools, 
it's not just the administrators and the people that are working um, with your kids. And it's, it's, it's all of them, but it's also us as parents, right? So how can we make sure that we're in a space where we can help our kids feel confident? How are we in a space where we can empower our kids to be responsible um, and help them continue to, you know, develop in, into these productive and responsible citizens who thrive in college, career, and life. And so that's our goal. And we hope that, you know, today you're able to see like how we're, how we're moving forward with that vision um, through our work with parents. So what I want you to do is I want you to take a moment, and this would be a great moment for you to pause um, and think about what comes to mind when you hear the word social emotional learning. So if you need to take a moment and pause right here, um, this would be a great time to do so. Um, but I want you to think about what comes to mind when you hear the word social emotional learning. And we'll move forward. Um, but again, if you need to pause and think about that, please feel free to do so. So social emotional learning, when, we, when we're talking about social emotional learning, social emotional learning is according to the Collaboration for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, CASEL, um, who we have a partnership with. CASEL leads the work in social emotional learning um, for the nation. And so we're um, very uh, privileged to have a, a contract with them um, and help them and for them to help us help coach us through this work, right? Um, and so according to CASEL, SEL is the process through which children and adults acquire and effectively apply the knowledge, attitudes, and skills necessary, check this out, um, necessary to understand and manage emotions. Woo, that's, that's good, right? So we all need to make sure that we are understanding and managing our emotions, setting and achieving positive goals, feeling and showing empathy uh, for others, establish and maintain um, positive relationships and making responsible decisions. What we love about this definition is that one, it's a process. So it's not just one of those things that, you know, we do from zero to 18 and then we don't do it anymore, right? Mm -hmm. At 20 something, we got to keep doing it. At 30 something, guess what? We got to keep doing it. At 40 something, we got to keep doing it. Should I go on, right? <laughs> and so it's one of those things that, we are constantly, it's a process, we're constantly in it. It's a lifelong thing. We're constantly understanding and managing our emotions. We're constantly in a space where we need to set and, you know, set and achieve the goals that we have set for ourselves. Um, we're constantly in a space where we need to feel and show empathy and compassion for other people, right? Um, and hopefully, you're always thinking about, you know, how you can maintain the positive relationships in your life and um, even as adults, we have to be thinking about how we're making responsible decisions, right? So it's a process. It's, it's something that's continuous, um, and we're constantly in that space of doing all of those things. Um, what I also love about this definition is that it says children and adults, right? So a lot of times when people are talking about social emotional learning, they want to make it to where it's a, you know, it's a student thing, or it's a, you know, is a student thing, but it's not just a student thing, it's a us thing too, right? As parents, we have to think about this. And so um, when we're talking about uh, social emotional learning, that was really important just for us to level set and anchor, um, anchor you in this so you, we are all working with the same definition. So again, when we're talking about social emotional learning, we're, we're looking at this is the framework that drives our work, um, what we're doing in our district, right? Um, and so when we're talking about social emotional learning, we really are talking about five competencies. Um, and those five competencies are self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making, right? So the orange part of this wheel is about, those two competencies are about you, right? So your ability, self-awareness, your ability, again, to be able to identify, identify the emotions that you're feeling, having an accurate self-perception, being able to uh, be aware of your own personal biases, right? Being aware of those because you can't address what you're not aware of. So being aware of that. And so then as we move to self-management, self-management is again about you. And it's about how you're self-motivating, how you're self-regulating. What is your stress management like, right? Um, if you're at home, 
Um, with the kids during this time, you've had to figure out, um, and hopefully if you haven't, um, but you're thinking about like how you can make sure that you're doing what you need to do for yourself to make sure that you're um, keeping your stress levels down, right? So thinking about that. So managing managing yourself, right? That's what that's about. So self-motivating, self-regulating, organizational skills, stress management. That's what we're talking about here. And in the self-management part is really about managing those feelings and those biases that come up right? So that they don't turn into um, microaggressions on other people. And so then as we move into social awareness and relationship skills, that's about how we do things, how, how we exhibit these things um, with other people. So that social awareness um, is our ability to be able to take, the, take on the perspectives of other, other people. It's our ability to have respect, um, respect for diverse populations, our ability to understand what's happening and what's going around um, going going around um, around us relationship skills is, a, is our ability to be able to build and maintain relationships with other people how are we what's our communication skills like how are we um, connecting with other people so that responsible decision making that's the yellow that yellow piece right there right so the responsible decision making is the threader and so regardless if I'm in self-awareness, I should be in a space where I am making responsible decisions. If I'm in self-management, I should be making responsible decisions. Social awareness, making responsible decisions. Relationship skills, making responsible decisions, right? So I should constantly be in a space where I'm evaluating, analyzing, and thinking about like, what is my ethical responsibility to myself in the situation, what is my ethical responsibility to other people? And so that's the five competencies. When we're talking about social emotional learning, those are the five competencies that we're talking about. Um, the outside of the circle, I'm not gonna spend too much time on that, but that's really, when students are able to see um, these competencies reflected in multiple contexts throughout their day, right? So they're able to see, you know, SEL in their homes and in their communities. They're able to see SEL in all of their schools so not just when they're in elementary school and then they don't see it in middle school and not just in middle school and then they don't see it in high school but they're able to see it every school that they're that they go to seo is representative and then also they're able to see it in classrooms right so it's not just this teacher over here is phenomenal with building relationships and you know and exhibiting these five competencies but regardless of what class the student is in they're able to see seo um, present um, and so when students are able to be able to see um, these competencies across multiple contexts in their day, that's when they're able to really thrive um, and not just survive, but they're able to thrive. And that's what we want for your kids. Um, that's what we want for our own individual kids and all of the kids in uh, Guilford County Schools. Um, and so as we move forward, here's another example of when I was talking about each individual competency. Here's some more examples. Um, you heard me when I was talking about self-awareness, being able to identify those emotions, having an accurate self-perception, um, being able to recognize what your strengths are and challenges. We don't like to call them weaknesses, but just your opportunities for your opportunities for growth. And so that self-management you see right there, impulse control. So when you've been, if you if you're working from home, you've had to, you know, not constantly be going to the refrigerator and grabbing snacks, right? So those impulse control, but it also may be that you don't say everything that comes to your mind, right? Um, and so being able to manage that. And so a stress management, um, that self-discipline, self-motivation, goal setting, organizational skills, you see that there. Um, again, social awareness. You heard me talk about empathy, perspective taking, all of that. Um, so here's just examples of, some more examples of um, each individual competency for you to think about and reflect on. All right, so now we're gonna watch a very quick video. Um, just to recap social emotional learning, um, feel free to jot down any thoughts um, or things that stick out to you as it relates to social emotional learning. <laughs> Thank 
social emotional learning is essential. It's the tools that kids need to be resilient, to be problem solvers, to be good people. SEL is really about the holistic development of, of young people. SEL is trying to bring a balance to the individual and what are the personal competencies you need to develop to be successful. How do you pull them all together so that kids can relate and navigate the world more effectively? The myth was that knowledge was information that could be bolted on to a brain like any other kind of mechanical part. The truth is knowledge is constructive. The truth is all learning is relational. The truth is that emotion drives attention and attention drives learning. Social and emotional learning is about how you do school. It's about what the student experiences, what the student learns, how teachers teach. We can think about schools and classrooms, uh, out of school time spaces, families, etc. as places where there is an exchange of knowledge, knowledge about the world, knowledge about yourself, and knowledge about the other persons that you're interacting with. All of those kinds of experiences, I think, help form and expose and shape the ways in which young people understand themselves and other people. And we start talking about the whole child. Does your child understand self-awareness? Do they understand social awareness? Do they make good decisions? Are they responsible? And then we start talking about what that applies to academics and looking at all the essential skills we need them to be successful in life. Children learn when their heart is open, engaged, connected, and filled with purpose. Learning is magical. And through SEL, we can create conditions that allow all kids to access that magic. Social emotional learning is essential. It's the tools that kids need. Thank you so much for taking a moment to watch that quick video. Hopefully that um, just uh, gave you some even more uh, context of what we're talking about when we're talking about social emotional learning and why this work is so very important. Um, at this time, we would like for you to um, grab your sheet of paper or you can use your cell phone, the notes in your cell phone. But we want you to think about um, what it is that you want to be true for your child um, once they graduate, all right? So just take a moment and I want you to think about what it is that you want to be true for your child once they graduate. And you can think about this in terms of four to six adjectives that describe like what will be true for them. Like for example, um, if I think about what it is that I want for my kids, I want them to be compassionate. I want for them to be resilient. Um, those are always ones that come to mind for me. I want them to be flexible. Um, I want for them to be um, in a space where they're always can um, have respect for other people. Um, so those are four things that I want for my kids. And so I want you to think about what it is that you want to be true um, for your kids. And while you're doing that, I'll also ask if Cynthia could share um, some of the things that she wants to be true for her beautiful babies. <laughs> so I had some of the same words you had. Resilient is always on my list. I want my kids to be independent. Um, I want them to be kind. I want them to be able to solve problems. Um, and I want them to be happy. And, 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 and being able to understand your emotions and regulate your emotions help you um, to be healthy, happy and help you to be resilient. You muted yourself. It may be helpful for me to unmute myself. <laughs> um, but I was just saying, thank you so much for sharing. It's always um, good to, you know, just kind of think about like, and not what it is that you want for your kids, right? And how you're helping um, create opportunities for them to be what it is that you, um, what it is that you want. And so that's really good. Um, so the rest of you, if you could, you know, if you need to pause, um, pause right here for you to continue thinking about that. And maybe if you want to share um, with someone in your household, um, that would be really cool. You could share with your kid, like, hey, this is what I want for you. Um, this would be a really awesome moment to do that. Um, but we're going to move forward. So if you need to pause, please feel free to do that right here. So when we're thinking about, um, we talked a little bit about what it is that we want for our kids, right? And we thought about what it is that we want to be true for them once they graduate. Well, here is what employers are wanting for um, 
our kids to be, right? So 92% of surveyed executives say that this is what they want um, to be true for our kids <laughs> once they graduate, right? So they want them to be complex problem solvers, critical thinkers, to have creativity, um, to be able to people management, right? So be able to work with other people, coordinating with others. Um, so that teamwork and um, being able to be work in groups and, uh, you know, just basically work with people, right? Um, they want for them to have emotional intelligence. So um, that's always a surprise for a lot of people that emotional intelligence made the list, but emotional intelligence is on there. Um, judgment and decision making. So remember one of our competencies was responsible decision making. So judgment and decision making is what um, surveyed executives want for their employers to have. Um, they want them to have a service orientation. So being dedicated to other people, um, being able to be in a space where they can negotiate and have cognitive flexibility, right? So these are the things that employers are saying that they want our kids to ha have. So we have our hands full, right? Um, but definitely we can achieve it. Um, and what's always interesting in the conversation that comes up is that, you know, of course we want our kids to do well in school, right? Um, we want our kids to, you know, make good grades and all of that. I've never ever encountered a parent that said, I want my kids to make bad grades, or I don't care what kind of, you know, grades my kids make. I think at the heart of all parents, you want your kids to, you know, do well in school, right? Um, but what's really important to note here is the valedictorian is not the, you know, um, while that's like such an awesome honor and that's, you know, nothing, not taking anything away um, from someone who reaches that level of, of honor at their school. Um, but it's really important to note that it's really about being able to be in a space where you can work with other people, where you can have that cognitive flexibility and um, and creativity and you know critical thinking and you don't necessarily have to be at the top of your class like you can be um, you know you can be like a regular student that have these skills and you're gonna go so so far and so um, that's what's really important um, to note about these 10 skills identified. Cynthia am I missing anything with that or would you add anything to it? No, I think you covered it well. Um, I will say um, one that stood out for me uh, was creativity. And because I read something recently um, where we generally think of creativity, at least I do, think of creativity as the arts and um, dramatics and that sort of thing. But creativity is also that ability to think flexibly and to problem solve. If you can come up with creative ways to approach a problem and be innovative, that that can be a, um, an academic skill as well as an arts skill. And I hadn't really thought about it that way. Um, yeah. So seeing it on a list of what employers wanted kind of was surprising. But once I heard it described that way, it made so much sense about why you would want that to be able to think creatively. Yeah, that's, a, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so just something else to share with your kids um, and to think about um, as we move forward in this pre presentation to how you can help them um, with developing those skills. Awesome. All right, so um, as we continue on, so um, Latrell has um, thoroughly described and explained what SEL is and why we're doing SEL and your responses um, to the tips activity with what you want for your kids helped us to think about why we're, we're teaching SEL now in our district. And this slide um, represents another piece of research about um, teaching SEL skills in school. And so in this research study, they interviewed uh, administrators, teachers, and parents. And so administrators and teachers all believe that if we teach SEL in school, we will reduce negative student behaviors such as bullying. And of course, that's something we all want is we don't want our kids being bullies or being subjected to bullying. So if we teach SEL in schools, administrators and teachers believe that that will slow down or stop. The parents in this survey said, if we teach SEL in school, we will have safer schools and we all want our kids to go to safe schools. And so families believe if you teach it in schools, this is gonna happen. And then all three groups, administrators, teachers, and parents, believe that if we teach SEL in school, that SEL teaching in school is just as important as academics. And Latrell kind of mentioned that um, in the previous slide that academics 
are surely important. That's why we're all in education and that's what you all want for your kids. Academics are greatly important, but so are the social and emotional skills. And so it's really important to have both and all three groups agree to that. And so that's a case for us um, approaching SEL in schools. But we also wanna talk about what we're here for today is how you can be an emotional coach an SEL coach for your child, because we all know parents are our children's first teachers. You have your kids um, before they even come to school, you're starting with them. And then throughout their careers, they'll have a teacher for a year or two, but they have their parents for a lifetime and their family for a lifetime. And so they're learning these skills from you as much as they are from us at school. And so these are some, these four bullets here are about some of the things that you are already teaching to your kids whether intentionally or not, just by being at home with you. So um, our children learn from their parents and their family members how they feel about themselves. So they start developing their self-image, their self-esteem. They start developing that um, from the time they, they are cognizant of being in this world. And so they are getting that from the way that they interact with you and the way you respond to them, the way you talk to them. Um, they're starting to identify who they are based on those interactions. They also start to understand how people respond to their emotions and their feelings. And so they start to learn that if I'm sad, this is how my mom or dad is gonna react. If I'm mad, this is how my sister or my brother is gonna react. They start understanding that their feelings are attached to how others respond. And so the more we are coaching them on matching up their feelings with how we respond in a healthy way, the healthier their development will be emotionally. They start to think, learn how to think about feelings. And so we're gonna talk about different types of coaching in a little bit, but in some of those types, some uh, of us adults approach emotions as if they don't count or as if they're a negative thing. And some of us approach them as it's, it's healthy, it's normal, but however we feel about emotions, our kids are starting to pick that up from us. And so they start picking that up again by, based on how we respond to their feelings and how we respond to our own feelings. And so if we manage our feelings well, then we're modeling for them how they can manage their feelings well. If we struggle in that area, we're modeling for them how to struggle in that area. So we have to really think about how we manage our emotions, how we model for them and how we are teaching them to manage their emotions. And so that kind of leads to that last bullet is they're starting to learn that they have choices about how to react. They have choices about how to respond. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit, how our emotions drive our behaviors. And if we want our emotions to um, help us to choose behaviors that are productive, then we have to have that self-awareness that Latrell talked about earlier. We have to recognize our emotions. We have to recognize how they're impacting us. And hopefully we can self-manage and choose the responses that we find the healthiest for us or the most productive in our families. And so um, we're gonna share a couple of tools with you to help you with managing your emotions for one, but also helping you think about how you teach your children to manage theirs. So we're gonna go through this emotion cycle. So on the left side, it's just some um, notes that you can read that match up with this diagram. But I'm gonna talk you through the diagram, um, explaining each of the steps. And I'm gonna use an example from my, my, my life, my parent, my family, my children. Um, and so you can also think about your experiences. But the emotion cycle um, happens for us whenever we are feeling an intense emotion. Well, it actually happens whenever we're in an emotional cycle, period. But it's most pronounced when we're having an intense emotion. And we typically, um, if you're not already self-aware and not already good emotion scientists, you may not notice it until you've gotten to the place where you've made the, um, an action that you didn't like. And I'll say I've been guilty of that. I'm much more aware of it now that we've been doing our SEO work and I can interrupt it differently, but I'm gonna talk you through it and help you understand how it works. And then we're gonna talk through how to interrupt it. And so the cycle starts at the very top where you see prompting event. And so a prompting event is just a thing that happens. This thing happens, it carries no meaning, it just happens. The meaning doesn't get attached until we get to that next circle, which is interpretation. So interpretation is how we interpret that event, how we attach meaning to that event. And what's important to note about interpretation is that interpretation happens inside of us. And so interpretation happens um, filtered through my values, my um, feelings about this situation, my feelings about this person, if the 
person is there before, if I've been in this situation before, it's impacted by how do I, my habits, how do I normally respond in situations like this? And so interpretation in most cases do not include external factors. And that's gonna be important when we start talking about how we interrupt it. But um, in the story that I'm gonna tell you, um, this is a story with one of my kids. And so like many parents, I struggle with my kids keeping their rooms clean. And this particular child, um, one of my kids, I have three, one of my kids has the most trouble with keeping her room clean and it really drives me crazy. And what really, really drives me crazy is when she's doing something fun as if she didn't know her room wasn't clean. And so in this prompting event, I had gone to her room to put the laundry away and the room was a mess and she was downstairs watching TV or playing a game or something. And so the event is I'm putting away laundry in a dirty room, that's it. It doesn't carry meaning. It's going that situation is gonna mean something different for you than it did for me, than it did for her, than it did for the next person. Going into a messy room is gonna affect us differently. But for me, my interpretation was because we've talked about this so many times before, I am interpreting this as she doesn't respect me, our our, our household, and she doesn't appreciate the things that we provide for her. She doesn't respect us enough to follow our directions and keep her room together. And she doesn't appreciate the things that we provide for her because they're all over the floor and they're just in disarray. And so that is my interpretation. It has nothing to do with her input. It has nothing to do with if there's a reason why it's a hot mess today. It has none of that in the, in the interpretation. So the next, um, the next two parts of the cycle is the physical response and the urge to act. And those happen pretty close together and they're, they're biological. They just happen without thought. So that physical response has a purpose. The physical response is how your body responds to this emotion that you're feeling. And it serves as an early warning system. It's alerting you that you're in a cycle. It's alerting you that something's going on. And so for me, in this scenario, I'm feeling angry or frustrated. So I'm feeling um, the heat in my face. Some people feel it like tension in your shoulders. Some feel it with their fists balled up. There is something physical happening to let you know you're in a cycle. If it's a fear and worry that I'm, I'm feeling, then um, that'll sometimes show up in my stomach like butterflies and um, a little nausea maybe. Some people get dry mouth with certain feelings or you get sweats. And so whatever that physical response is, you know what yours is and you know which, how it uh, um, changes with each of those feelings. And you, um, almost simultaneously, you have an urge to act. And so you have some, you have to do, your body has to do something with that energy behind that emotion. And so you have this urge of what you want to do. So in my story, I'm feeling um, the physical response. I'm feeling this um, heat in my face and this tension in my shoulders. And my urge to act is to call her up and yell at her and just get in her face and let her know how much I didn't appreciate it. And so the thing about the urge to act, you may or may not actually do that urge. And the urge may or may not be productive, but you have an initial urge. And that's followed by what you actually do. Because remember that, that emotion needs something, somewhere for that energy to go. And you have to do something with it. And so the action could be what you were urged to do, or you could do something completely different, especially if you took a beat, you took a pause, but you do you have an action. And that action may or may not be productive. And so if you choose an action, action that is productive you choose an action that you uh, can live with then your emotion will calm back down and you'll go back to equilibrium but if you choose an action that you didn't like that wasn't healthy that didn't work for you it is likely going to cause a new emotion and that's the after effect it's going to cause so your after effect can be equilibrium and calm if you like your action or your after effect could be a whole new emotion because you didn't like the action and now you start the cycle all over again. So in my story, I called my, my daughter up and I yelled and screamed in her face just like I was urged to do. So my action was yelling and screaming and letting her know I didn't appreciate it. But the after effect was she's standing there looking at me like she doesn't understand and pitiful and all that. And so the after effect is I feel guilty because now I'm upset, she's upset, and the room is still a hot mess. So I didn't get what I wanted. And I don't want her to, you know, her to think if she makes a mistake, that's the feeling, that's, that's what she's going to get from me. And so that wasn't the most productive response for any of us. And so now I'm in that cycle of guilt, and I have to do something different. And so for you, um, 
the point here is that you understand when you're in a cycle and you understand if that cycle is taking you somewhere you don't want to go and how you can interrupt that. And so that's what we're going to talk about next is understanding how emotions work, that emotions are just information and um, they're temporary and we can't interrupt that cycle. And so if you're in a space where you can recognize it and interrupt it and get more productive um, actions out of it more often, you're going to find yourself in a healthier space emotionally, and then you're going to be modeling better for your kids, and you're going to be teaching them how to do it um, if you understand it. So I'm going to walk you through it again, the same cycle in words here a little more quickly. So you have that prompting event that, again, has no meaning, so you can't really do anything to interrupt your cycle there because it just happens. Things happen, life happens. But the interpretation step is a good place to stop and interrupt. Because in that interpretation stage, you're telling yourself a story based on your stuff that I mentioned before. But if we pause and take a moment and consider, are there other interpretations? Could there be something else going on here? Or can you pause and get more information? So I could have paused and said, I wonder if she didn't clean her room because she had this big project to do at school. Or I wonder if um, she didn't clean her room. Actually, what it turned out to be, to be honest with you, is she thought it was clean. We just had two totally different definitions. And so one thing about the interpretation step is you can just get more information. So instead of calling her up and yelling at her, I could have called her up and said, what's going on with your room? Why is your room not clean? Then she would have said, which is what happened in the second part of the cycle. And then she said, it is clean. What do you mean? And then I'm like, well, this is not right. This is not right. This is not right. And so I getting that information helped me to see help me to get more information and see that we just had two totally different interpretations of clean. So then my action was completely different. Instead of yelling and screaming, we problem solved and we had a better outcome. And so getting more information or thinking about reframing what could actually be going on here instead of just using your internal stuff. Um, but if you don't catch it at the interpretation step, you have that physical response to alert you that you're in a cycle. So for me, if I'm stressed and worried, I don't usually catch it until I get that physical response. And so when I feel that weirdness in my stomach, it will tell me to stop and think, what's going on? What am I worried about? And then I, if I'm really thinking about it at that point, I can think it through. So physical response, urge to act will help you think about, if you pause that urge to act, it will help you think, am I about to do something that I'm going to regret later? And we're not going to be perfect with this, especially when the cycle goes quickly. Um, we're not going to be perfect. There are going to be times that we're going to choose to act in a way that we don't like and we have to go back and fix it. But if we start practicing pausing where we can, we'll, we'll be in the habit of pausing, which is where I am. I pause way more than I used to. Um, and so I don't go and have actions that I'm going to have to go back and fix later. Um, but that urge to act gives you a chance to make a choice. Now, once you act, you've acted. And so if you've acted and it wasn't what you wanted, you're going to have that after effect and you're going to have to go through a cycle again and deal with it if it was something you didn't like. And so I found myself um, having to go back and fix situations or apologize for things I said or things I did because I didn't interrupt my cycle and I had to go back and fix it, which is fine. Again, we're human. But if you can catch it before and you do a lot less of that. And so I want to share my favorite quote, one of my favorite quotes over here on the side. It says, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And so looking at this diagram, between that prompting event and your action, there is all this space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. We can choose how we want to act. And so the point here is that our emotions don't control us. They're just giving us information. And then we use that information to make our decisions. That's our response. So in our response lies our growth and our freedom. So as we practice... Um, interrupting our cycle and making better decisions, we're growing and we're changing our behaviors and we're changing um, our habits. If we have a habit of acting out of our emotions in negative ways, we're breaking that. And that is the freedom. We're free from allowing our emotions to control us. And so I just love that part about we're growing and we're free and our emotions are just tools. They don't control us. And so let's continue on um, with Cynthia, the second. Can I ask you a quick question? Um, Please do. Yeah, so like, cause that is just really, can you go back? That's so powerful in thinking about that and how we parent. So what I hear you, what I hear you saying is, if my child is doing something that's stressing me out, that has me in the space where I just want to flip out, um, 
then I need to, as the emotional coach, as the parent, I need to be in a space where I can pause. So that right. I can, is that like, cause yeah, that. <laughs> yes, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. We, okay. we have to manage our emotions first. And so right. I, I would say that what we're talking about is kind of threefold. One is that we have to manage our own emotions before we can coach our kids. And then two, we have to model for our kids and, and um, model so that they can see the examples of how we manage mm. it. And then three is how we coach them so that they can do it on their own. Mm. And so we can't just um, go, jump right into helping them manage their emotions when we can't yeah. manage ours. Yeah. And like when, 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 you, when Latrell talked about the definition of SEL and talked about that process and it's lifelong, it's, we're lifelong growing. We haven't right. always been good at managing our emotions. We're not always good at it now, but we are continuing to grow and be more aware. And so we can't do our, we can't do our kids if we can't do ourselves. Yeah, yeah. That's so good. I just really wanted to come back to that. Cause I think, you know, it's when you're raising kids and like, it's really important for us to think about like how we're like, we have to pause. Um, right. And so that and interrupt <laughs> all the time. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that we can grow. And we can have freedom, y'all. So right. thank you so much for, you know, That's I just right. felt like thank I needed you. some more this morning. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's perfect. So that is one tool. That emotional cycle is one tool. Here's another tool, um, the Mood Meter by Mark Brackett. And, um, and so the question to decide is, how are you feeling today? And you can pause the video if you like, and you can answer that question now, or you can wait until I finish talking about this chart and, and talk about it. But this is a common everyday question. We often greet each other with, how are you? And so the thing is, we typically respond, depending on our relationship, of course, we typically respond uh, without thought. And we typically respond with simple feelings like fine, good, okay, happy. But what we have to think about is, can we really honestly, truly name how we are feeling? That is huge. Being able to name how we're feeling helps us with that emotional cycle and it helps us to manage. So again, this is a skill that we need to develop for ourselves and then we need to help our kids. And so many of us don't have the vocabulary, particularly our kids, don't have the vocabulary to answer this question honestly. Now there are other parts to it that we're not gonna talk about today, like the relationship you have with the person that you're talking to. Um, that's another part of how you answer this question and how you ask this question of others. But what we want to talk about today is just how we name our feelings and our emotions. And so this mood meter chart, again, um, developed by Mark Brackett, has um, two axes. And so the way this table works is that that X axis, um, it's going across the bottom. I, I'm moving my hands like y'all can see them. Let me move up. But that um, X axis is how pleasant that feeling is. So we try not to tell our kids that emotions are good or bad but some are more pleasant than others. And the, the unpleasant ones, we don't wanna stay there because they're unpleasant. But it's important to recognize those um, so that we're keep creating healthy kids and that we're healthy. If we try to deny those unpleasant emotions, we're not um, being honest and true to ourselves and we're not um, gonna be healthy emotionally. And then that um, Y axis is the energy, how intensely are we feeling that emotion? And so and it's divided into these quadrants. And so like the yellow quadrant is high energy, pleasant. It is so good, I'm hyped. This is um, joyful, pleasant, positive. You see the kinds of words are in that box with that top corner being ecstatic, the most energetic, most pleasant. The, um, beneath that in the green area, it's pleasant, but it's a little calmer, less energy behind it. And so I'm in a good space, but I'm not like busting out with this emotion. And so with the bottom most corner, the um, most pleasant, least energetic is serene. It's a positive, good feeling, but it's very, very calm. That blue quadrant is not very pleasant, but not in a high intensity um, unpleasantness. And so these feelings are not the ones that we want to stay in. We don't enjoy them. And they're not very pleasant, but they're not like urgent and intense and pushing. And so the corner of that, the least pleasant, lowest energy word is despair. And so it's not a space you want to stay, but it's not as threatening as a red. And so then when we look at the red, that is unpleasant, 
and high energy. I am intensely not feeling this emotion right now. And so um, you can see what kind of words are there. And the top corner of that one is in, enraged. And so we don't want to stay enraged. If we're having that feeling, we really want to think about how we can interrupt that cycle. And so it's looking at this chart, it's important that you and your kids are able to name um, your feelings. And so the reason we like to use this chart is because of that, dividing it into quadrants kind of helps you anchor it. If I can't get the exact word, I at least know I'm yellow. I at least know I'm energetic, pleasant. I at least know I'm green, I'm calm. Um, pleasant. And so starting with the color grouping helps us to focus in. And then when we can start focusing on the words and being even more specific, and then um, some of these words will spark other words that you can think about how you name your emotions. And so it's really important. And so I will share um, another family story here. And this, this um, mood meter is also an app. It's a 99 cent app. So I will put that out there that it's not a free one. Um, but what, and it's a very simple app, but what I like about it is I'm trying to teach my kids, um, these vocabulary words. And so if they can't tell me, um, the specific word that they're feeling, then I'll have them try to tell me what is, what's feeding their feelings. And then I'll try to help them navigate it. And so with the app, if I click on, so like you see joyful and happy, those are very subtle differences but if you click on it on the app it'll give you a definition now you can do it without the app you can google and all that to um, help you with trying to find the different shades of meaning but it's important to help your child figure out how the emotion attaches to the word is really important because sometimes um like i'll say like you you don't want to discount a child's feelings but if they're super angry about something that really could have been a blue it, we, it's our job as coaches to help them figure out, is that really the word you want? So it, we're not changing your feeling, but we're trying to help you with the word. So back to the story, trying to teach the kids these words. And um, I have a five-year-old who obviously being the youngest, she struggles the most with the words. And so we, we practice with those. So one, um, one evening at dinner, um, she, was, she had um, lemonade, which she spills, she spills her drinks a lot and so we're often talking to her about that so she had spilled a lemonade and we had told her that because she spilled it she couldn't have more lemonade she could have water and so she was highly upset about that um and so after dinner was over and she was still asking for the lemonade um and i told her no and then um she had gone upstairs and i heard all this commotion and she was upstairs beating the stuffing out of her stuffed animal just beating it which to the like that much anger was a little bit disturbing for me but then i was like well let me just try to have this conversation with her and so um i asked her what she was feeling and she couldn't tell me and i said well i'm, I'm thinking that you might be upset about the lemonade and she was like no because she thinks i'm gonna be mad so she's like no and i was like i'm i'm sure you are i know you're you like lemonade i know you're disappointed um that you didn't get to have the lemonade and i said and i saw you you know beating up your bear and so i think you're feeling angry and um i said and so she's still like no i'm not angry and but i had seen her with the bear so in my head she's angry and so but angry is too her intensity was too much for lemonade and so i was trying to get her there and i said well you know we have more lemonade you can have lemonade tomorrow um so maybe what you're feeling is frustrated or annoyed or whatever word i tried to get her to say um because that much anger over lemonade when you know you can get more is probably not the correct feeling, right? And so she's like, okay, she kind of indicated she understood what I was trying to tell her. And then as she was leaving the room, she goes, um, oh, by the way, I wasn't angry, I was sad. And I was like, okay, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not totally sure sad was the right word either, but the fact that she was thinking about which word expressed what she was feeling um, was important to me because it's it's progress we're, we're on the road and so that's that's a part of what you want to do as an emotion coach is help your kids attach the feelings without actually changing them i didn't change her feeling some sort of way about the lemonade but i did want her to have an appropriate feeling to go go with that lemonade so i hope that makes sense um, and that this tool can help you with that so again i'm going to ask you how you're feeling and if you want to pause the video, this is a great place to pause and see if you can figure out which word um, demonstrates how you're feeling and also see if you can 
think through what attaches you to that feeling. So if you choose happy, what's making you happy today? If you're feeling glum, why are you feeling glum today? And something else to think about with the mood meter is if you're in um, a space where that's not where you want to be, right? It's okay to stay there if you want to stay there for a bit. If you're feeling lonely and you want to be lonely for a little while, or if you want to be, if you're tired and you want to sit and tired for a little while, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you want to move, you want to think about what's causing you to feel that way to help you think about how to move. And so again, you can pause if you like and kind of explore these words and pinpoint which ones work for you. Um, and we will continue on. All right, so finally, we're gonna talk about specifically coaching your children um, as emotional coaches. So those first few tools were about you and your child. And these are um, a couple of other things to think about when you're coaching your child. And so another research study, there are four, from this research study, there's four styles to being an emotional coach. And these three on this slide are the ones we want to try to avoid. And then on the next slide, we'll look at the one we wanna to aspire to. Now I will say, these are the styles to avoid does not mean you're never going to find yourself in one of these spaces um, but it's important to be aware of these styles and the impact that they have on your children so that you can make changes uh, where you need to and so um, the first one is the dismissing parent and this is the parent who feels like like kids are kids they don't have true serious emotions or emotions are um they're not important or it's just something to be avoided we don't want to deal with emotions that's that touchy feely stuff over there and so what happens if you're this parent and you're not helping your child deal with their feelings is that they're going to feel like there's something wrong with having feelings which we already know that's that's unhealthy um or they're going to feel like there's something wrong with them because they're having feelings that they're getting the message they're getting a message that feelings aren't important or that kids don't have feelings but they actually are having feelings so they might think that there's something wrong with them but with that they don't learn how to regulate their emotions because they're not being dealt with they don't learn how to regulate emotions the disapproving parent is that parent who thinks that um, feelings are weaknesses or manip manipulative and so that's kind of like that idea that boys don't cry because that's a sign of weakness or that um that girls are used are crying to get your get you to be a manipulative that girls are crying to get you to do what they want um kind of thing or that they're just acting out because they don't want to do what i asked them to do that's a, a disobedient piece and so it's kind of just it's, it's saying that their feelings again aren't valued but they're not valued for a different type of reason and so in this scenario the kids may end up confused because again they're feeling something that's not being acknowledged by their parent the person that they trust um, or they're going to be disobedient because that's the message that you're giving them is that that feeling is um, you trying to be disobedient. So they're like, oh, okay, so that's what I'm supposed to do. And they do that. But in this style, they, they don't learn to regulate their emotions. And so then the laid back parent is the parent who does recognize that their child is having feelings, but they're not giving them strategies of what to do with that. And so it's kind of the parent who says, um, yeah, um, like kind of like rubbing the bag. Yes, you're sad or yes, I understand you're angry. It's okay, it's okay. But we don't go any further than that um, and show them what to do with that. And a lot of cases that's because we may not know what to do with that. So hopefully you're gonna get some strategies today to help with that because emotions is not something we talked about a lot in our, at least in my age group in, in our youth um, at home or at school um to a great extent so we may need some help with that which is why those previous two tools can be helpful for you um, but these kids um, will potentially have trouble concentrating because all those emotions are swirling around because they're encouraged to express them but they don't they don't get to do anything with them they don't get to interrupt it and so they have all these emotions um, in them that they don't know what to do with so they have trouble concentrating they often have trouble making friends because they don't know how to regulate emotions with other people and so they're giving their friends they're giving other kids um, these emotions or they're receiving emotions from the other kids and they don't know what to do with that because they don't have those skills and so they have trouble with their friends and then again they cannot regulate emotions and so in all three of these styles we're not helping our kids learn to regulate emotions and that's that's our goal is helping them recognize their emotions so that they can manage them so that they can regulate them and so what we want to aspire to is the emotional coach style and so with the emotional coach um, style uh, where we all are which is why you're here today is we're we're saying 
that we recognize that our kids have emotions and that they have to learn to do something with it. So that first bullet is that we see it as an opportunity. They're feeling an emotion that's an opportunity for them to stop and think about where they are, what's causing that emotion, but it's also an opportunity for us to coach them. Um, and so we don't get frustrated. We don't dismiss them. Um, and I, I said this earlier, that third bullet, we don't tell them how to feel, but we do, and it's, it's really sensitive to try to do. We don't tell them how to feel. We don't tell them um, that their feelings are wrong or bad, but we do try to help them see the connection between their feelings and their behaviors. And so before this work, I was an elementary school principal. And I can remember getting students in my office who were in trouble, who were angry, and they would come in with their fist all balled up. And so remember from the emotional cycle that that's a physical response. But that was my cue that they were not ready um, to talk. And so I, I would say, you know, when you're ready, let me know. And so when I saw their hands unclench, I knew they were ready to talk. And a lot of times what they were super mad, angry about was something that really might have been frustration or embarrassment or some other feeling that took them to anger and took them to an intensity that caused them to act in ways they shouldn't. And so trying to tell them, um, I would tell them, like, it's okay to be angry. Um, I can be, I will be angry too if somebody did blah, blah, blah to me, but how you choose to respond to that anger, how you choose to use that anger, um, we can find a more productive way to do that. And so that's what we're saying here with our kids is, it's not that you can't be angry. It's that your intensity of anger doesn't match the situation, like my daughter with the lemonade, or your intensity of anger is causing you to make decisions that you're going to regret later, like some of my students may have done. Um, and so this is a good time to listen and empathize with your kids. So if you look at the benefits for the kids, so then the kids are going to learn to trust you more and trust their feelings because you're hearing them, you're responding to them, and you're not trying to change them. They learn to problem solve because that's what you're coaching them to do, to make decisions out of your emotions that are productive. It's going to build their self-esteem because they're going to learn to manage their emotions. They're going to understand that they have some self-control, some self-awareness and self-management. And so that's going to improve their self-esteem. Um, and they're going to have better relationships because they can regulate emotions in this model. And so just a couple more strategies. Some of these we talked about already. A couple more strategies um, or thoughts to have when you're working with your kids at home. Um, this first one, respect, is important to us. Um, we talk about this one a lot because a lot of parents think about the separation of adult and child, which of course I, I completely understand. And so, but when we start talking about emotions, we have to understand that our kids are little people and they do have emotions. And so that being able to express their emotions is not a way of um, them showing disrespect. Um, and so we have to show, open the space for them to have the conversation and not feel like I'm being disrespectful to my parent if I share that I'm feeling this way or I'm being disrespectful, be, being disrespected because they are not hearing me. And so we have to we have to find that space for that, that that separation of what is kid talk and adult talk, but also keeping it where they are able to actually talk to you, which is gonna lead to that trust piece. If they can honestly talk to you and tell you who they are and what they're feeling and why, and you can talk to them back without judgment and without saying, well, you're just a kid. You know, They're gonna learn to trust you more and trust their feelings more, which we talked about in the previous slide. But this listen to understand is another one that's really important to us um, to talk about because often as parents, we're very busy. We're running a household. We have jobs. We have spouses and partners. We have kids. We have a lot going on. And so when one of our kids is um, expressing an emotion and they're trying to talk to us, we are, we tend to be, I won't say all of us, but we tend to be quick to hear a part of what they have to say and then we have to answer. We are adults, we've lived this, we got the answer, let's go. And so we're saying pause to listen and fully listen to understand. Um, a couple of things can come out of that. One, they're gonna um, feel trust, respected and trust you more. They're gonna feel heard, but you also may hear things in there and what they have to say that you hadn't anticipated if you had just listened to a part of it and started answering. But you may hear um, more details that would take you in a different way in how you coach them. You may hear that they actually are on a road to solving it themselves. You may hear a bigger problem or a lesser problem, but you've got to listen 
to understand exactly what your kids are trying to tell you and what they're trying to express to be the best coach that we can be. And so it does take time. Um, and like I mentioned, I know we're busy people. It takes time, but we got to think about the long-term benefits of who we want our kids to be like you did in that tips, what you wanted your kids to be. Um, I want to talk about that every child has his or her own unique talents and abilities because that one really shows up if you have multiple children. And so um, that kind of, I raised the oldest one, been there, done that. So this one is going to get this and this is going to get this one. They're totally different human beings. And I know you know this, but they're also totally different human beings in how they receive and express emotions. And so specifically about emotions, um, listening to them as individuals to hear how they express themselves, what they're feeling, but also it helps you to um, use, as it says here, use their unique talents and abilities in the problem solving part. And so when you're helping them problem solve that is specific to their, who they are and what their strengths are, that's gonna go back to that nurturing their self-esteem because they're, they're gonna then play on their strengths as well. And you're gonna help them problem solve more specifically. And finally, I think we mentioned this earlier too, that modeling piece kept coming up, but you've got to model um, the behavior you want to see. And again, that is a hard one. I can tell you in, in the Brown household, there are times that I hear my kids say things to each other that sound horrible, but then I realize they heard it from me kind of thing. So it makes me adjust my behavior. And of course, I know there are things that are for adults that are not for kids. And you can tell that to your child. Like I did this because I'm the adult, but I don't expect children to do that. But when it comes to managing your emotions, you've got to, um, you got to think about what you're letting them see. Um, because they, if you are acting in a certain way out of anger, they're going to start acting a certain way out of anger. If you take to your bed when you're sad, they're going to take to their bed when they're sad. And so you got to think about what it is that you want them to see. So I'm gonna pause here and see if Latrell has anything to add to this slide because this is our real parenting moment right here, talking about our real, real lives. I know. <laughs> now, I think you always cover it so beautifully. Um, when you were talking about that listen to understand piece, I think it really connected for me to go back to um, that social awareness competency and how we are able to take the perspectives of our kids right? Um, and uh, respect the diversity and the uniqueness of them, um, which I think like what you were talking about is like sometimes because we've been there and done that and we like, you know, have the t-shirt, the fluorescent socks and everything to go along with it. It's just like, it's so easy for us to just jump to solution mode versus being in a right. space where we're really understanding like where they are and that they are different from us and how we coach them um, and really just try to listen to where, where they are and, and try to provide them um, with the best coaching possible on, um, on certain issues. So it really just took me back there when you were talking. So Yeah, that's good. Perspective taken. That's good. I love it. Yeah, which is hard because, you know, I want to go straight to, you know, a lot of times you're, you might think like, oh my gosh, you have no idea. You don't know anything. Right. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is our kids are like, so brilliant and you know and they probably know a ton more than what we knew at their age right, right. Um, and so just being able to have those like real conversations with them and the, say hey I value you I value what you have to say and maybe I may not be flexible in this moment I may not change um, my right. stance but I value you your thoughts your opinions and um, and your in and, and what you're thinking um, and what you value matters to me and so I think that that um, is important when we're talking about building relationships and, and uh, creating environments that are respectful and trusting and right. all of that. Like we have to make sure that our kids are feeling that their, their opinions, um, as trivial as they may seem to us, that we value them and, That's right. and where they're coming from. So I think that this is, you know, um, a really powerful slide when you think about all that it entails and also difficult sometimes too, right? Yeah. Because, you know, if you, if you, uh, I know I heard a lot growing up, do as I say and not as I do, right? That's right. And I think that although I turned out, you know, pretty decent, um, I think that, you know, we've got to be more of that last one when we're talking about modeling the behavior um, that you see, you know, and that was just evident the, other day, I see it in my three-year-old niece. I see it in my five, uh, my seven-year-old nephew. I see it in my kids and thinking, like you said, and it's not that it's like you're doing these horrible things that they're modeling, 
but it's still like the stuff that you know like uh, I, well yeah. I kind of I kind of did that so maybe you shouldn't yell <laughs> yell, at, <laughs> right. yell at them for doing that because I kind of did it so we got to work on that right, right. Um, so that's that's really good yeah I agree thank you I agree all right so one more strategy that we want to talk about um to help with regulating emotions. This one is for you and for your kids. And so that's why we saved it for the last tip of the tip section is um, this idea of deep breathing exercises. And so you can see on the slide, all these benefits of deep breathing, but a couple of other benefits that aren't listed, listed here that go with what we're talking about is um, that practice deep breathing helps you to learn to pause. And so a couple of things happen. Um, I do practice deep breathing and um, so now if I find myself in a cycle or I'm feeling something intense, I can pause myself and take a few deep breaths. And it causes a couple of things. It causes um, more um, oxygen to your brain, that in improving blood flow that you see on the slide. That gets oxygen to your brain and it kind of turns everything back on. And so your amygdala is not taking over and you're having, um, I'm trying to figure out how to say this without getting too technical and the brain stuff, but you're kind of turning your systems back on so that you can think. Um, and the other part of it is that it's, it's pausing for you to stay in that moment. And so that pausing is going to help you stop and choose an action before you actually do it. So if you and your child practice deep breathing exercises, and there are um, plenty of free ones, um, there's a lot of paid apps, but there are plenty of free ones on YouTube. Um, that you can you can access just to practice. There's some that are for you and some that you can do as a family or do with just your kids and um, to practice that. And that's going to help with the emotion, emotion regulation as well. So we're going to watch a quick video that talks a little bit more about the benefits of deep breathing. This is one of our favorite videos, so we hope you like it as much as we do. So the first thing I learned as a monk, this is by Jay Shetty. I lost my mouse. So I remember my first day of monk school, I've just shaved my head, I'm now wearing robes, I still look like I'm from London, like I can't get away with it. I'm walking around and I notice this monk who's teaching, this monk's 10 years old and he's teaching a group of five-year-old monks, right? And I see him teaching, he looks like an adult, like, wow. you know, his ability to like teach these five-year-olds and conduct himself and he's got this great aura about him and so I'm kind of eavesdropping on his class I can't obviously go and sit with a bunch of five-year-olds even though I really want to because I'm like I feel like a five-year-old next to that ten-year-old and I, I went up to him and I said what are you doing and he said oh well we just taught their first class ever and I said oh cool and he said well what did you learn in your first class at school and I said oh well I learned the alphabet and numbers and I said well what did they learn he said do you want to know what they learned on their first day of school I said yeah of course he said the first thing that we teach them the first thing you learn at monk school is learning how to breathe and I said why he said because we're taught that the only thing that stays with you from the moment you're born to the moment you die is your breath all your friends, family, the country you live in, all of that's gonna change. The only thing that doesn't change, that stays with you from the moment you're born to the moment you die is your breath. And he said, notice, when you get stressed, what changes? Your breath. When you get angry, what changes? Your breath. When you're sad, what changes? Your breath. When you're happy, what changes? Your breath. Every emotion is experienced with the change in the breath. So he said, when you learn how to navigate and manage your breath, you can actually navigate any situation in life. Mm. And I was just blown away. I was just like, wow. And then I remember researching it and noticing how athletes were taught how to breathe, musicians, singers, especially those who play wind instruments who have to reach really high notes. They're all trained how to breathe because they have to use their breath in challenging, stressful, pressureful right. situations. Right. But I was like, so are all of us. You've got to go on stage in front of 10,000 people. You've got to go do a concert. You just lost a deal or a contract. Our breath changes in all those scenarios, yet we don't know how to use our breath to change our life. Right. And so for me, that was a huge learning point where I just thought, wow, that's what you're taught. The priority is on the root of things, not the 
leave for the symptoms. And that's the biggest thing about living as a monk. You're not dealing with your challenges at symptomatic level. You're dealing with it at root level. Right? People say, oh, if you're stressed out, just take a stress pill. If you're stressed out, just go to get a massage. If you're stressed out, just, just relax, watch Netflix and chill. But all that's doing is pacifying you escape for that hour, two hours, maybe a week. But going to the root of it and learning how to change your breath means you can manage any situation in life. And, and that principle, that's an example of the principle which is so much deeper, that always go to the root. It will take longer, but it will last longer. Right, right. Right? If you go to the root, it takes longer, but it lasts longer. But if you go for the symptom, you get it quick and it, it never and lasts. It, and it never lasts. And yeah. we don't know that. Yeah. So that, that was the deepest principle I learned as a monk. You always go to the root. Cut down the root of that weed in your heart. So we hope you found that as meaningful as we have and just gave you some more thoughts about why deep breathing is so important. And I will hope you um, try out some of the, the br deep breathing um, activities on YouTube. So as we um, end to a like come to a close with our presentation, we still have a few more slots, but um, it's really important for us to think about like this concept of making sure um, that we're taking care of ourselves as parents and that we're doing what we need to do for us because when we thrive, our kids are able are going to be able to thrive. When we're not doing well, like our kids are not going to be able to do well. And so. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit today about self-care. And when I tell you this, um, this wheel, these eight dimensions of self-care really just changed my perspective on how I thought about self-care. Because originally when I would think about self-care, like I would think about um, some of the things that um, was mentioned in the video, like going to get a massage or going to get a pedicure, get my nails done, like, you know, a day. Um, just shopping and just doing me, right? And so we think about in um, in a time like we're in right now, like of you know the pandemic, where you couldn't go do any of those things. So how are you going to take care of yourself, right? How are you making time to do the things that you need if all of those things have been canceled and closed, right? And of course they're starting to open back up now. But um, and so when we start thinking about um, when we think about eight, the eight dimensions of self-care, it's really self-care is more than systemic. It's more than how we eat, how we move, how we sleep, how we rest, right? It's more than that. Um, but it's emotive and thinking about like how we're expressing ourselves and, um, and it's luminescent. When we're thinking about like how are we illuminating our inner truth? It's financial. How are you allocating your resources and, you know, creating a space for um, you to be able to take family vacations or, you know, have it, have a savings that you're proud of, like um, cognitive. Um, Cynthia mentioned earlier about the importance of reframing. And so when we're thinking about the cognitive as a self-care, it's really about like how, how, how do we think and how are we able to be in a space where we can reframe our thoughts? And, um, you know, I was in this training with one of my colleagues and she was talking about like, um, the importance of reframing and how our brain is wants to um, immediately uh, operate in safety mode and protect us. And so it's important for us to also think and note about um, the fact that sometimes our brain gets it wrong. And we don't like uh, to think about our brain being wrong or us being wrong, but sometimes we get it wrong. And so when we're thinking about self-care, it's really about um, being able to think about how it is that we think being able to uh, reframe our thoughts. Um, aptitudinal, um, how is it that we're contributing to the world and sharing uh, with the world our gifts um, and you know, doing what we need to do uh, there and being um, you know, service oriented. Remember that was one of the top 10 uh, skills that uh, employers uh, or executives wanted from, from other people. So how are we contributing to the world? Um, relational, like how do we connect with other people, right? Um, and thinking about like, how are you connecting with the people that are in your home? How are you connecting with, you know, the clerk at the grocery store? How do you connect with people on a daily basis? Um, you know, and even during this time, it's been so important for us to think about how do we connect with people and how we can still keep those relationships thriving and maintain those positive relationships that are so very important. 
Um, uh, self-care is also environmental. I never thought about self-care as being an environmental thing ever, ever, ever until I was sitting at my computer for eight hours out the day. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I've got to go outside or I'm going to like freak out and, you know, and it's not going to be good for anybody in my house. Right. And so then when I started going outside and looking at the trees and the flowers and, I, and you know, and just getting that fresh air, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so good for me. Um, and it's good for me to do this for the people that are in my house so that we can just, you know, have that moment to, um, you know, just like recognize, you know, the beauty of the world and um, in the environment. And so it's really good. And I love this quote off to the side. It says that truth, um, I am true. not touching anything. Oh, wow. I don't know what that was. One second. Sorry about that. My um, hands are not anywhere near the computer. <laughs> <laughs> so this quote off to the side says that true self-care is not salt baths and chocolate cake. It is making the choice to build a life you don't need to regularly escape from. And I'm just going to read that one more time um, to let that sink in, is that true self-care is not salt baths and chocolate cake. It is making a choice. So here goes that choice, that growth and that freedom, right? Mm -hmm. It's making the choice to build a life you don't need to regularly escape from. Um, and that's from Brianna West. And it comes from an article that we read um, in our face-to-face -face classes. But in that article, she's, you know, she also talks about how important it is that sometimes you have to say no to some things. You have to say no to some people. And, um, but you also have to say yes to some things. And self-care is also about, you know, saying yes. Um, and so saying yes to yourself and giving yourself permission um, to take care of you so that you can be the best parent you can be. All right, here is a self-care plan. Um, and what I would like to invite you to do, and this would be a great place uh, to pause after I explain it, is think about like, you know, creating you a self-care plan and what is it that, you know, your mind needs, your body needs, your spirit needs, like what is it that you need to be able to thrive? Like, what is it that you need to do on a daily basis? Do you need eight hours of sleep or can you function off of five, right? But like, what is it that you need? Do you need to, you know, do you feel, you know, better when you eat on a, you're on a certain diet or, um, you know, or making sure that you're getting all your water and, or, you know, do you need your, like, I know Cynthia has to have that coffee every single day. Um, and like, look, there it is right there. So I know that she has to have that every single day and that's important for, you know, her to have to like kind of get her moving. And while I'm talking about her, I have, I have mine right here too, right? Um, and so like in thinking about like, what is it that you need in order to be able to function um, so that you're your best self, like um, for your mind, like right here, are some examples are, you know, is it certain music that you listen to? Um, do you need to meditate? Do you need to take lots of breaks? Like, what is it that you need in order to stimulate, um, stimulate your mind and keep, keep it going? I know for me, I love listening to podcasts, I, you know, have Audible downloaded on my phone. I finished like three books like in the last couple of weeks. Um, and so that's just really important for me to like constantly be in a space where I'm stimulating um, my mind, like thinking about like, what is it that your spirit needs? Also thinking about like, what is it that you want to accomplish? So on this example is, you know, peace is at the top. And so like, you know, for me, it's really important for me to protect my peace at all costs. Like I'm gonna do that. That's at the top of my list as well is thinking about like how I can achieve peace. And so when I think about, well, what brings Latrell peace? Um, one of the things that brings Latrell peace is organization. And so when things are kind of out of whack, when things are not like, you know, my house is not in a space that I want my house to be, it doesn't make me feel peaceful. And, you know, and so my kids probably get tired of me saying like, well, can you pick this up? Can you do this? Because for me, like I, I want to accomplish peace and I'm, very, um, uh, I take all precautions to protect my peace, right? Um, so, but thinking about like, what is it that you want to accomplish, whether, you know, it's, um, you know, serenity, like the examples on here, serenity, control, happiness, and like, and how, and what that specifically looks like. Like if happiness is one of the things that you want to accomplish, 
how do you achieve that? If you want to be a person who is physically fit, like how is it that you achieve? What, how, what steps do you take in order to be able to achieve that? Um, it's also important to think about like, you know, earlier Cynthia talked about like the mood meter and how important it is to check in with yourself. Um, it's also important uh, to have supportive people in your life, right? And so if you find yourself, um, you know, in blue or red, like who are supportive people that you can call to kind of help talk you off the ledge and, you know, help get you into a, into a better space. Um, and so having like a ready list available, like, hey, like I know Cynthia is a supportive person in my life, um, you know, and being able to have those people like written down, like right in there of those people that are supportive to you. And also think about like in that same vein, think about like, who is it that you're support for, you know, um, and thinking about um, and even reaching out to those people as, as a different, as a, as another way of part of your self-care plan. Um, and so I would like for you to pause um, the video at this moment um, and, you know, and write down at least like three to five things um, in each area uh, so that you can, um, that you can commit to as it relates to being able to creating a self-care plan for yourself so that you can be able to be the best you that you can be. All right, and so as we move forward, thank you so much for you know taking time to write those down. Hopefully you were able to pause the video um, before moving on to this, um, continuing. Um, and so we're wrapping up here, um, but something that we really want you to think about is how are you uh, constantly you know, in a space where you can model, coach, and practice uh, the SEO competencies. And you will remember that the SEO competencies were self-awareness, um, social awareness, self-management, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making, right? And so how is it that you're modeling that every single day, coaching that, um, and practicing that? That's so very important because, you know, Cynthia mentioned earlier is that we're not in a space where we get it right all the time. I think that now I'm in a space where I think about it a lot more than I used to, right? And I feel like you know, I've always been a pretty reflective person. You heard Cynthia talk about that reflection as one of her parents' superpowers. So I think in general, we're both reflective people. Um, but this is still work and it's still something that um, takes practice. Like, and I have to, when I go into my daughter's room and I see that it's closed everywhere, like this morning when I went um, in there, it's like a daily thing. But you know, I have to think like, okay, do I want to turn this into a negative experience where I'm flipping out? Or am I just like, you know, um, going to encourage her and think about like how I can, how I can help, you know, <laughs> in this situation? Because my first instinct, y'all, is to flip out and, you know, and be like, okay, so are we going to clean this room today? And, you know, um, but, and so thinking about like how it's a daily thing is what I'm getting at. It's a daily thing. It's a practice thing as parents. And we have to be in a space where we give ourselves grace. We give ourselves compassion. And, um, and we recognize that it's a lifelong thing, right? And that, that, like the definition said, it's a process. And it's not just one of those things that, um, that we're going to, you know, get it just like that. Um, and just think about like how we can create supportive environments in our home. Um, and even, you know, when, you know, Cynthia was giving the example about her daughter and recognizing that, hey, we had two different definitions of what a clean room was. We had, you know, like I've often, you know, had that experience with my kids with kid cleaning the kitchen. I'm like, I clean the kitchen. This is how it looks. When you clean the kitchen, you just wash the dishes. I'm confused. Like, how does that work? Right. Cleaning a kitchen means that you are sweeping the floor, you're mopping the counters, you're like, you know, putting the food up, you're doing all of these things, right? Um, and so just making sure that you're in a space that you are creating a supportive environment in your home um, and thinking about like how you can help, um, help your kids uh, like develop these SEO competencies as well. All right, so our optimistic closure is that I want you to um, think about like what you would want to be able to say about yourself as a parent 
um, by the end of this year. And if that's too far away for you, um, if you want to say, hey, like I want to be able to say this by the end of the summer, or, you know, you can put a different time frame on it, um, whatever works for you, but be able to, you know, think about like how you can develop a vision for yourself as a parent um, and thinking about like how you can, what areas what are your glows? Like, what are the things that you're doing really, really well? Um, and then what are your grows? Like, we like to call those. Like, where are some areas that, you know, I can, you know, I can get stronger in. I can, you know, I can do a little bit better in this, in this area. And so we want to give you um, the opportunity to be able to think about that. And so this would be an awesome time to um, pause the video and, um, and, think about like what it is that you want to be able to say about yourself um, as a parent by the end of the year. All right, so um, thank you so much for spending um, this last little bit with us. Um, we know that we covered a ton of information, um, but we are um, confident and 100% uh, sure that it will impact um, you as a parent, it'll impact you as an individual if you really take it to heart. Um, we would ask that you share any feedback that you have with us. Your feedback is a gift, um, and we would love to hear any feedback that you have. So if you could um, take your cell phone out and you can either open your QR code or you know, open the camera um, function. If you have an iPhone, open that camera function on there and it should pop up um, and or you know here there's the bit.ly code as well um, bit.ly link as well um, but your feedback is a gift we would love to hear it um, as we continue to develop presentations for our parents um, in the district we want to hear um, what you love what we could have left out um, you know we all always always take it um, to heart and so thank you so much for your feedback um, in advance for doing that for us and um, here is my information again, um, Latrell Adams, and um, there's Cynthia's information, Cynthia Brown. Um, our emails are there. Um, we're on Twitter. If you're on Twitter, um, please take a moment to follow us. That's our um, on um, prof our my, my professional Twitter as well as Cynthia's professional Twitter. Um, our GCS SEO office also has a Twitter. And so we would encourage you to uh, follow uh, all three of those because we are constantly posting about SEL and how um, you know, that can be a benefit for you in your home and resources um, for you. If there's ever anything that you need, um, please, please, please um, let us know. It's always been a pleasure, always a pleasure to help um, parents or to be able to give them resources and things to think about in, in order for us to be able to thrive more as parents is something I know that I'm uh, really passionate about and so is Cynthia. So thank you so much and I'll pause and let Cynthia uh, say uh, her goodbyes to you. Yeah, I kind of ditto what you said. Uh, we really appreciate this time with you. We absolutely love talking about SEL because we see the, the benefits of it. But I have to say, we really loved talking about it as parents. And so we really enjoyed our time with you. We hope that you um, got something out of it useful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have an amazing day. And pat yourself on the back that you made it through a whole presentation with us. <laughs> awesome. Have a great day.